Which question? What can I help you with? Is this the plane that um, they, they painted it all black to hide it during the night? Yes. This is the Douglas A26 Invader. So it's called Douglas A26 Invader? The Douglas A26 Invader. And it's painted black because this was the uh, the use of the A-26 during the Korean conflict because it had missions behind the lines at night, but there were single aircraft missions. And what they would do, they would bomb and strafe trains that carrying supplies, and they'd also bomb uh, railroad tunnels to close them off to, to keep the supplies from coming from the north to the south. The A-26 is the only uh, U.S. military type aircraft that saw action in all three wars. She entered service in the, toward the end of World War II. Uh, our aircraft actually saw combat in World War II. The Korean War was probably what we consider the heyday for the A-26. Actually, it was the, the airframe that dropped the, the first and the last bombs of the Korean War. Vietnam came around, it had been modified and updated with uh, various modifications, stronger engines and fuel tip, wingtip fuel tanks and so on and so forth, just to make it more of a special ops kind of a, a type of platform. A-26 is not very well known uh, in history. Uh, it actually represents the culmination of World War II technology. It has a laminar flow wing that the P-51 made famous, uh, so a fighter type wing. It has remote turrets uh, that the B-29 kind of pioneered. engines that really uh, reached their maturity in World War II, the Pratt Whitney R2800s, very powerful engines. So the airplane was built for speed. Uh, it was the fastest bomber of World War II, Allied bomber. Designed to replace the B-25 Mitchell and the B-26 Marauder, both of which were more well known. Essentially a revolutionary design at the time. This would have been the Bombay area. Um, depending on the kind of mission they went on, could have been in incendiary bombs or just normal 100 pounders that carry up to 4,000 pounds of bombs. Once they dropped their bomb load out of here, they would have continued on and done uh, strafing runs with the guns that would have been attached to the nose or to the wing. Um, this area was open like it is now, so you could move between the gunner's compartment and the cockpit. Uh, but most of the time, the gunner stayed back there until they got, you know, got done with their mission and or if he did start out in the front, he never moved to the back unless there was an issue. So the Commemorative Air Force is the parent organization. They technically own the aircraft. I mean, we call her ours, but it's just, you know, out of, out of affection, you know, we want to hold on to her. But they own the aircraft, along with about 160 others. Uh, so the Commemorative Air Force being the main group in Texas, they have these groups all over the country. There could be sponsor groups or squadrons or wings or, you know, there's different structures, different different types of organizations out there, but all have the same goal, you know, along with ours is just to preserve the aircraft, to fly the aircraft, and to just to interact with the public, to educate, and, and to be, uh, just to be kind of good stewards of the history. To fly the lady is, uh, about twelve hundred dollars an hour. It's about a thousand to twelve hundred dollars in fuel and oil. Fuel consumption. I'll start there. That's that's about uh, one hundred and fifty to one hundred and seventy gallons per hour. Oil is about two to three gallons an hour. These engines are radial, meaning round and there's 18 cylinders. Each cylinder is tapered, okay? Uh, especially the lower ones. At the base of the cylinder, it's wider, and the closer you get to the cylinder head, the narrower it gets. So all of our cylinders that are below the horizontal line, if the pistons stop in a wider part of the cylinder, then oil will seep past the rings and get down between the piston and the head. And then, uh, of course, as soon as we, we start up, the engine's starting to do its thing, and it just spits out all kinds of oil all over everything.
tires is the big, you know, the big topic for us right now. We've got one tire that's, you know, we got to get replaced. And so, you know, we've kind of done the math that cost per tire and the you know, amount of time we get at it. We figure it's about, it's about $100 per landing. So each time we land is $100 literally up in smoke. <laughs> so $4,700 for a tire and $500 for a new tube for the tire and have, you know, three or $400 for shipping. When I first arrived about eight and a half years ago, that was the city hangar. We did not have the joint use hangar at the time. About half of the hangar was loaded with stuff, old junk, and there was a crop duster inside. And we would use it to hangar transient aircraft when we could, but there wasn't a whole lot of space in it. Over time, we decided to clean it out. It had all sorts of junk, things left over from the years that passed, including the, the aircraft that was in there. So with some time, we were able to get it out. Uh, some help, I believe, from the Boy Scouts, we actually cleaned it out. So uh, after several months, we actually completely cleaned the thing out, and we could use it for transients more so than we, than we had before. Enter the joint use hangar. We needed a larger hangar to be able to house transient aircraft and aircraft that we had here, military and civilian, during storms. So we built the large joint use hangar, which is uh, quite a bit bigger than this hangar. Well, good morning. And good morning. interestingly enough, at that point, when, hmm, we, we probably need a new tenant for this big hangar. And no kidding, I get a call from Ken Larcher with the Commemorative Air Force in Oklahoma City asking for a hangar a vintage hangar like this one is, and it just worked out perfect. He came up, looked at it, said, that's exactly what I need, and uh, we offered him a, a reasonable rent based on the age of the hangar and the space that they would use. Uh, they brought the airplane up, and we had to make a couple real small modifications to the hangar, but she fits real nice. And uh, They've moved uh, all their stuff up here. They've actually built a little uh, office inside of it, so I think they're here for the long term. All right, uh, I got the left seat, Joe, you got the right seat, you got flight engineer. Yes. Excellent. Uh, weight and balance, right in the middle, talked about squawks, everything is good. Anything else overall on the airplane that's worth, worth noting? A few of the guys are from up here. Lahoma, Enid, we've had some people in Ames. You know, so basically this area, which, you know, a, a lot of those members, obviously we picked up when we moved to this, this area in, in 2012. But there are a few of us that come from Oklahoma City. They got 46 inches, they'll be committed at rotation. Uh, so feeling rotation or hearing the word rotation, that is what we'll stick with for, uh, for our board criteria. We're kind of all over and it, those are just the Oklahoma folks. Our chief pilot lives in Idaho. Uh, our operations officer lives in, uh, lives in Nebraska. We have our um, fundraising officer, lives in North Carolina. So Texas, you know, our, our members are, are kind of scattered all over the place. East, once we get in towards the Terrell area, just because it is right on the edge of the, uh, the class Bravo airspace, but we should be well below by that point. It's neat to be able to say, hey, we have one of the uh, Commemorative Air Force aircraft here that uh, has participated in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Uh, there are just not that many around anymore, and occasionally we will put it on static display. Folks from the local community and the, in the outlying areas can come out and take a look at it. We do that generally during fly-ins, during the uh, spring and summer months. It's really neat to have it out here for also for flights. Uh, people can purchase a seat on the aircraft and actually go up in a flight on one of these. They work real hard to keep that aircraft running. Quite a few volunteers that uh, come in and work on the weekends, volunteer their time, and uh, they, they do a really good job over there keeping that airplane flying. Probably the biggest challenge is, that I would see is gaining new people. Because at some point we're gonna have to hand this over. You know, we're, we wanna keep it going. We wanna preserve our piece of history and out of a deep appreciation for our fathers and grandfathers came before us and what they did for, uh, for our country and for the world, really. Uh, this is a piece of it for us, and we want to preserve that, and that preservation requires that there be somebody coming up behind us.
on the tail there, the serial number of the airplane starts with a one. What you don't see is the four, because in World War II, the Army Air Corps didn't put the decade on it, they just put the second digit, because the assumption was the airplanes weren't gonna last 10 years that by the next decade, there'd be a new uh, generation of airplanes. And so it's actually a 41 serial number, but you just see the one. Uh, so here we are in, uh, in 2018. We're very deep into the airplane maintenance-wise this year, and we probably won't ever get into her this deep again. Uh, the Federal Aviation Administration has what's known as airworthiness directives, or what we call ADs, and they're federal law. And ADs are, always associated with a safety factor on any given model of airplane. And on this particular airplane, we had to check the wing spars for cracks in certain areas. And that was a combination of a, a die penetrant inspection in places, other places we had to do an eddy current inspection. We had to check for, for fractures in the bolt holes that hold the wing spar to the plane. Um, and that involved taking out fuel tanks and oil tanks because those bolts are in the interior of the plane, obviously. Gary Trice today is our director of maintenance, uh, and he's really the last of his breed. Uh, he's an Air Force trained radial engine mechanic. He served in Vietnam as well, and uh, you just don't find those guys anymore. You don't find that level of knowledge uh, anywhere. When we took the airplane apart for our ADs, we knew we had uh, one tank that might be bad, and when we got in there, we found both auxiliary tanks bad. And there's a company in California that builds tanks, and they build them by hand. And we send them our old tanks, and they duplicate them. And uh, they're pretty expensive. Uh, for two 100-gallon rubber bladder tanks, it was $15,000. And that was taking place in California. We had to, had to ship the old tanks out there. They shipped us the new tanks. We had to put the tanks up in the... Uh, fuel bays to get the fittings correctly drawn in so we can send them back to California and back to us again. So that, that took about eight, nine weeks just for that to happen. This big black bladder right here is a 300 gallon fuel tank. And the aircraft has two of those, one on each wing. And then it has two 100 gallon rubber bladders in it. So uh, we have a total of 800 gallons of fuel. And uh, this tank is still of the World War II variety that it's actually uh, self-sealing in case shrapnel or a bullet goes through it. Uh, it has a compound in the center of it that will expand and close the hole when gasoline hits it. Modern materials are very thin. The old tanks were like three quarters of an inch thick and these are three thirty seconds of an inch. And where the old tank was almost 90 pounds, this one's 29 pounds, so we're saving a lot of weight. Part of what our group uh, excels at is trying to, look, trying to look ahead and trying to see, okay, how can we position ourselves to be as sustainable as possible and have as few things catch us off guard as, as possible, so. What I'm doing is hooking up the Warlock seal drain on the uh, boost pump. You know, our maintenance guys, they, uh, they focus on preventive and predictive maintenance to an extent to say, okay, these are the things that will, um, will ground us. These are the things that could be catastrophic for us. So we, we were able to prioritize and get things uh, replaced proactively to try to head off, you know, unnecessary costs. And, you know, and that, but that entails its own cost. It gets pretty hot out here at times. In the winter time, we set a bottle of water out here. If it freezes, we go home. <laughs> but for every hour of flight, I think we figure about 15 hours of maintenance. We do uh, flight testing of the airplane, and then we got to get uh, the pilots. They got to do their certain amount of time to practice. So we'll go out and you know, practice, do touch and goes, stalls, simulated engine out, stuff like that. Our standard operating procedures are built as such that uh, that we can, you know, head off kind of instances as they come up. You know, our fuel pressure transmitter got air into it, and it, it wouldn't provide us with an accurate reading to the cockpit. In essence, it looked like we were losing fuel pressure to the engine. You know, we took off, and we had an indicator 
you know, an indicator fault that, uh, you know, was like, well, what, what does that mean? Is that saying that uh, it, it is an issue or is, an in, is it an indicator problem? We have uh, compass oil between the transmitter in the engine and the uh, instrument gauge in the cockpit. And it's a safety factor because we don't want to have raw fuel going all the way up to the cockpit. So what happened on this flight is that we had air in that uh, transmission line. We lost compass oil. So we made the decision in flight, okay, are we going to press on to where we're headed, you know? Or are we going to, are we going to circle back, you know, and, and, and put it on the ground and take a look at it and see what we need to do? We opted uh, for, for, for the safer approach, you know? We were here, we were close to our home base. Uh, so we circled back and, and put it on the ground and, and determined that it was it was a compass oil. It was a it was just a, a part failure, but it wasn't catastrophic. You know, working together as a team is a big thing, and I think that keeps us from having really major incidents with the crew or anything, or with the airplane even. We operate it very conservatively. We we don't do acrobatics with it or anything. We don't do any uh, high G maneuvers. We have a committee as part of our group, and what they do is go um, see what air shows are out there for the upcoming season or what's, what's lying ahead, and see if they can develop contacts and find out who's coordinating these shows, and, and basically just try to get a, a, a contract with these shows to, to be there. And in that contract is gonna be typically an appearance fee. Uh, there's you know usually cost for, for fuel and oil and such. But that's a big part of, of how we've historically generated revenue. We also try to find donors and you know and sponsors, and uh, we have a bomb train that, that we take around to a lot of the shows. A man came up to me and said, hey, Ken, you want four bombs? Being a little reluctant, I started asking questions and found out that he had these bombs in his, in his yard somewhere near a lake, and he was using them as buoys, and he wanted to get rid of them. And the moment that I saw these bombs that he brought to the air show, I saw this, this is what I had in my mind. Hooked them all together, and how we get it to work is that the air show provides a Kubota or an ATV or something, and it hooks onto the front, and this thing all day long will have kids ride in it. I've seen kids stand an hour and a half for a three minute ride. The parents love it, and uh, it's fun. It's just something different, something for the kids to do at the air show. The guys that came before us, you know, the, the, the greatest generation, if you will, and what they sacrificed and what they made happen is something that we don't want to forget. We would be well served if we preserved as much of that history and that, uh, that mindset and that dedication that our, that our forefathers had and, you know, preserve that. You know, it's, whether it's taught in schools or not, you know, uh, might be a different subject, but we want to at least make sure we're doing our part to offer it up as, as a piece of history that, hey, this is, what, this is what happened and this is how we overcame it. This is how our country came together to fight evil. And we, want to, we want to preserve that. It's just, we feel it's just very important to do that. So every time we see, we come across a, a veteran, um, you know, at air shows or they come to the hangar or whatever, our world essentially stops when they come around because they are those exact people, those precise people that we do this for, is to preserve what they did the dedication and the sacrifices that they made and preserve it for future generations. Because otherwise, if you, you know, if you lose touch with history, you're, you're gonna repeat it, right? Two left, two right, 100 in the arms.